Good morning, happy Easter, and welcome to Sylvania First. My name is Kevin. I do the music here, so I should really sing, happy Easter, there you go. All of us here at Sylvania First share the mission of building life-changing relationships through and with God, and we want to know you. Whether you're with us online or in person, we'd love to connect with you in worship. To interact with us in online worship, you'll need to log in through live.sylvaniafirst.org. From there, you can respond to questions or join in our prayers through the chat box. Our opening question on this Easter is, what does Easter look, sound, smell, taste, or feel like for you? If you're with us online, you can dive into that question through the chat box now. If you're in the sanctuary, share your response with someone sitting near you, or get up and walk and find someone on the other side of the aisle. That's a fun thing to do, too. Hi, I'm Ashley, and I'm so glad you joined us for worship this morning. We will begin in just a moment, but before we do, I want to share with you some exciting things that are going on around here. First, on Mother's Day, May 8th, bring mom to worship with us and stay for a food truck rally Sunday afternoon in the Circle Drive. Our Love Your Neighborhood 419 Book Club meets next Sunday, April 24th at 7 p.m. We're reading Reaching Out by Henry Nowen. I hope you can join Julie in the conversation as we deepen our faith and imagine new ways to love our neighbors. Today is the deadline to commit to this year's youth mission trip in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on July 17th through the 22nd. Please let me know today if you want to be a part of this mission experience and you have not already registered. If you have any questions about their trip, or if you wanna ask me about financial assistance, please see me after service today. And now it's time to announce this year's Vacation Bible School theme, Compassion Camp, changing the world with loving kindness. The goal of Compassion Camp is to cultivate compassion for each other, for ourselves, and for the world. The dates for Compassion Camp will be June 14th through the 18th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. each day. Registration will begin on Mother's Day, but I hope you make plans now to join us. You can find out more information about all these things on the scribble sheet available at the back of the sanctuary, as well as at sylvaniafirst.org. You can also follow us for daily inspiration through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're glad you're here. 
Welcome to worship. And happy Easter. Welcome to worship to all of you. My name is Tom Rand. I am the pastor here at Sylvania First. I'm joined in leading worship by Ashley Wynn, who is our director of InReach Ministries, Julie Carter, our director of Outreach Ministries, uh, Kevin Foster on the piano, uh, and Josh Dufford uh, with the choir. And we have a brass choir this morning, so um, pulling out all the stops, so to speak, we're, we're, we welcome you uh, into worship. There is one more announcement that I wanted to make sure to, to lift up. Uh, Joy, Just Older Youth, is meeting this Thursday in the gathering space uh, at noon to have a meal and to hear from Carlo Gibellato about what it was like growing up in northern Italy uh, and to uh, have some conversation with, with him and see some pictures about that. So now is the time uh, when we practice our cheers and chants as a church. Everybody ready to do our cheers and chants? You know what our cheers and chants are? Here's our cheers and chants. I say, Christ is risen, alleluia. You say back to me twice as loud and with twice as much emphasis, Christ is risen indeed, alleluia, alleluia, like you're trying to one-up me. You ready? Christ is risen, alleluia. All right, so we're going to use that again later in the service, so, um, so just be, be ready for that. Our opening question this morning is this, what does Easter look, sound, smell, taste, or feel like to you? When I was growing up, uh, y'all may not know this about me, I was a trumpet player, uh, and so uh, I, I played in a brass choir, and I would uh, come to worship uh, at my home church and then in other churches or around the city uh, to play Easter services. And so uh, Easter sounds like the, the sound of the trumpet horn drawing us to awareness of Christ, uh, that Christ is risen. Um, how about you, Ashley? Um, for me... Easter looks like uh, excited kids getting up, getting as sugared up as possible before uh, church. <laughs> How about you, Julie? So, oh, so for me, um, I like to think of a newborn baby on Easter. Um, when you think of the smell um, and even the touch, think of that new life that has come about. Um, that's where I go on Easter. So, PT. So hear the story. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, just as the sun was beginning to rise, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she saw that the great stone that had covered its entrance had been rolled away. So she ran to find Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they put him. And so Peter and the other disciples raced to the tomb, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter. And when he got to the tomb, he ducked his head in and he saw the grave clothes all rumpled in a pile, but he did not go in. When Peter got there, he rushed right in. And he saw the grave clothes rumpled and piled up there, but he also saw the veil that had covered Jesus' face folded neatly and placed on the shelf where Jesus' head had lain. They looked at each other, and John came into the tomb, and he saw that face veil, and he believed, but they still didn't understand the scripture about how Christ was to be raised after three days. So they returned back to the upper room where they had been staying. But Mary Magdalene, she stayed outside the tomb. 
and she was weeping bitterly. When she looked into the tomb, she saw two angels sitting there, dressed all in white, one where his head had been and the other where his feet had been. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they put him. She turned and rushed out of the tomb and ran straight into Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus said to her, Mary, And she said, Rabboni, which in Aramaic means my teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet risen. But go and tell Peter and the other disciples that you, that I am ascending to my father and to your father, to your God and my God. And so Mary rushed out of there and ran into the room where the other disciples had gathered and she announced the good news, I have seen the Lord. Friends, Christ is risen, alleluia. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia, alleluia.
Would you join with me in this affirmation of our faith? This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross, reconciles all things to God. Amen. You may be seated. As we enter into our prayer time, we always begin with prayers of thanksgiving. And so if you are with us online, we invite you to enter your prayers of thanksgiving into the chat box now that we can share with the whole congregation. If, uh, if you would like to make a private prayer request, there is a separate prayer request button that you can push that will put you into a private chat room to have a, 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 a private conversation with, with someone who will be happy to pray with you. But if you would like to share your prayers with the church, which we encourage you to do, we invite you to do that through the chat box. So what are you thankful for? Today, I'm thankful for the gift of music and the gift of musicians. So um, my son, Will, had a recital on Tuesday night at St. Olaf College in Minnesota, uh, and uh, we were able to be there, and it was absolutely spectacular and heartwarming. It was a, a huge gift for us as, as parents to be able to be there. Uh, this, uh, this Thursday evening, uh, Kevin Foster premiered uh, his uh, his. Uh, Monday, Thursday, cantata at Epworth United Methodist Church, and so I'm grateful for him and for his gifts and, uh, and for the gift that he has offered to us, arranging all of the music this morning for the Brass Choir. Uh, and so thank you, uh, Kevin, and thank you, Brass Choir, for being here, and thank you, Choir, for your offerings. Let's sing our praises while uh, you continue to share your thanksgivings in the chat box. So there's a thick stack today, and some of them are duplicates. So if I don't say your name, we know that you have a prayer request in here, but there's a lot of Happy Easter and Jesus, so just know that we got it, okay? Because <laughs> we're there with you. All right, so this is from Mary Berlin, Jesus, and this is from Barb Hartman, The Love in My Friend's Eyes. I want to hear that story. I love that. Um, Sarah Levens, All the Help with the Church Cleanup, Especially 20 Boy Scouts. That was awfully nice of them. Gary and Marlis, thank you, Lord, for our risen Savior. Um, and Nancy Ruff is a ditto there. Uh, Tom and Teresa Fitkin, friends, family, church, and health. Uh, the Young Peters, Easter, he is risen. And Dick Duvick. And Gail and Les. Okay, sorry. Um, Levi. Levi. All the Easter eggs he found. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, this is Michael Ragusa, Jesus is Risen. This is Vicki and John Dillon, our daughter and son-in-law here for Easter. So fun. Um, 
Jim and Carol Herman, the fact that Jim is actually in the sanctuary on Easter. That's wonderful news. Um, Gail Turner, beautiful children and grand and great grandchildren. Um, Delene Porter, my soon to be new great niece, Grace Finnegan. Um, this is from Donna. Easter and my family um, here and with the Lord. Um, and then, sorry, I got a lot going on here this morning. Um, Chris Stearns, thankful for safe travels for my dad and stepmom on their return trip from Florida. Um, Kristen is chiming in with us from Florida, and she's thankful that this morning she gets to spend Easter with her mom and still be in worship with all of us. And then Barb Quigg, praising the Lord for this beautiful day and for family and friends. P.T. We know that whenever we gather for worship, we also carry things on our heart as well. And so if, the, if you're online with us, if there's something on your heart that you would like to share with us, we invite you to do that in the chat box now. As a church, I want to ask you to pray for Margaret Elliott, uh, Mike's mom, who is uh, struggling with the shingles right now. Also want to invite your prayers for uh, all who mourn the loss of Patrick Leoya, for the police officer who shot him, for the city of Grand Rapids, for our country, that we may learn to see one another and love one another as Christ sees and loves us. And once every 33 years, Easter, Passover, and Ramadan all coincide on the same date. And so, um, as, as the Psalms invite us, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that Christians, Jews, and Muslims may learn to see one another in the light of God's eternal mercy and love. Let's sing as we continue offering our prayers. So um, from you all in the sanctuary, some of the things that are on your hearts this morning, this is from Heather and Brittany and Levi, Grandpa Terry, Uncle Steve and Chris Heine. Um, this is from Tom and Teresa Fitkin, Ukraine, um, our nation and those with health issues. Um, from Nancy Ruff, her children, um, Donna, the people in the Ukraine. Um, this is from Deline, people who are alone today. Uh, Gail Turner, faster healing for broken ribs. We're praying for you too, Gail. Um, Jim and Carol Herman, Ukraine, same with John and Vicki Dillon. Uh, Michael Ragusa, very stressful situation at home that's literally making him sick. So we lift him up. Um, Gail and Les, friend Aaron, her husband passed away unexpectedly Friday morning. So we'll pray for her. Family in Japan with COVID, that's Dick Duvik. Um, climate refugees, which outnumber Ukrainian ones, that's from Betty Dorcas. Um, Kay Wright, prayers for brother in the hospital. And then online, Sherry Holdridge is asking us to keep the family of George Campbell in our prayers. George is a, was a retired United Methodist pastor. Um, he died yesterday, and so she's asking us to pray for his family, specifically his wife, Jeannie. Um, Kristen is asking for continued prayers for her mom's health. Ray Lynn is asking us to pray for Demetrius and Barb Quigg for healing so that I may return to worship in person. PT. Will you pray with me? 
Risen Lord, hear our prayers of thanksgiving for the graciousness with which you hear, for the patience with which you listen, for the grace with which you care. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving for the ways you accompany us through deep valleys, for the ways you lead us to still meadows, for the ways you provide all we need. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving for transforming death in resurrection life, for blessing and breaking ordinary bread, for opening our eyes to recognize you. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving. Risen Lord, hear our cry for help for those surrounded by the shroud of death, for those beaten down by the weight of oppression, for those hemmed in by illness, visible or veiled. Hear our cry for help for those weighted down with worries, for those carrying the burden of distress, for those overwhelmed by isolation. Hear our cry for help for those who are afflicted by war and violence in Ukraine and everywhere, for those who are mourning their losses, for those who continue to fight for peace. Hear our cry for help. Risen Lord, inspire our life together that our ways be formed by your way, that our lives be shaped by your life, that our love be your love and hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you're with us here in the sanctuary this morning, you may have picked up a scribble sheet as you walked in. And as you hear the scripture read this morning, we invite you to wonder with us about the scripture and its meaning for us today. For those of you joining us online, you'll find the same questions in the note tab at the bottom of your screen to help guide your reflections. We encourage you to use the Bible tab to follow along as the scripture is read. We are reading out of the Common English Bible from John chapter 20, and we'll begin in verse number 19. When I think about Easter, I think about joy, resurrection, new life, and hope. But the emotion that the disciples felt most strongly was fear. Think about it. They'd just seen their teacher crucified. Their hopes in a Messiah were crushed. And the oppressive system that took him to the cross was still at work. They were in hiding. What kinds of fears do you imagine were rising in them? Hear the scripture. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, 
they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you have seen me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray with me? Risen Christ, open our eyes <clears throat> that we may see you everywhere. Amen. So I was on a spiritual retreat a number of years ago, and my friend Nick popped up right before lunch and announced that he was organizing a gro group to go to a local museum to, uh, to do a thing they called Visio Divina, which is looking at art in the same way we sometimes look closely at scripture, deeply contemplatively, listening and trying to find ourselves in the art and, and listening for what God is saying to us through it. We had a group do that last week um, down at our own Toledo Art Museum. I already had plans for that afternoon, so I couldn't go with them. I was going to learn something about fresh expressions, actually, in, in the area, uh, but felt torn because I really wanted to go with my friends. I kept my prior uh, appointment, but when I rejoined my friends at dinner, all they could talk about was the exhibit and what they had seen and how deeply it had moved them. I felt left out, like I had missed something important. When have you felt left out? Have there been times when friends or family members have experienced something extraordinary, but you were off doing something else and missed it? I got notes from Nick and went the next day to see some of those same highlights, but I was alone and I wished for my friends to help me process all that I was seeing and receiving. I went from gallery to gallery following Nick's map throughout the museum and when I turned the last corner, I saw this. A massive painting. It filled an entire wall. It was called the Resurrection Cookum. Cookum? Stanley Spencer was a British artist in the early 20th century. He painted this between the wars in 1924. It is a depiction of the churchyard in his home parish in Cookham, England. In it, he painted people that he knew who were rising and emerging from their graves in response to Christ's call. On the left, you can see people reading their own tombstone inscriptions <laughs> and, and, and tidying one another up after being in the ground for a while, right? In the back is, is the River Thames, or, or is it the River of Life? In the center sits Christ on a throne, or is it a throne? You know, the, the throne itself looks a little bit, I think that's God the Father who is supporting and sustaining Christ on his throne, holding him up. And in Jesus' lap, that's a little child. Jesus said, suffer the little children and let them come to me. Directly in front of him is a boat, a slave ship whose now free passengers are disembarking to join the resurrection party. And on the right in this picture, you can see Moses up there at the top. He's the guy with the tablets, along with other notable bi biblical figures kind of lined up against the wall. You know how they do in statues in, in, in churches. Uh, it also includes children climbing out of the graves as well as old men. In the foreground is a woman tending the garden. Is it Mary Magdalene? And on the far right in the foreground, the artist painted himself rising at Christ's call. 
I stood in front of this painting for hours, drinking in every detail, experiencing the faith of the artist who did not see resurrection as a single past historical event for one very special person, but he saw it as something we will all experience. As I was drinking it in, I, was, I, I began to wonder, what does it mean to be raised in daily life? What does it mean to let go of what needs to die in me in order to be raised to new possibilities? I wondered, who would be in my resurrection garden if I had the kind of artistic talent to paint something similar? Standing in front of the painting, the feelings of being left out faded away, and I found myself in the garden with Christ. When Mary Magdalene found the stone had been rolled away from the tomb, she ran to tell the others who were hiding in the upper room. Peter and the beloved disciple came racing. I wonder what Mary felt when she saw the stone rolled away from the tomb, and she was confronted by the stone-cold entrance staring at her. What might have stirred in her heart? I wonder what motivated Peter and the beloved disciple to rush to the tomb. I mean, when was the last time you rushed to see death? What were they feeling as they approached? Why did the beloved disciple stop short? Why did Peter rush in? And how did they feel finding it empty? I wonder how Mary Magdalene felt as she lingered outside the tomb. Should she look in? Should she stand guard? Where is Jesus' body? All she wanted to do was anoint him. She wept and prayed and prayed and wept. Her tears were so heavy that they kept her from being able to see what was right in front of her eyes. When have your tears or your fears kept you from seeing hope? That evening, Jesus appeared to all the disciples who were locked away in the upper room. Mary Magdalene had already announced to them that she had seen the Lord. So why do you think they were still hiding out? What were they afraid of? Who were they afraid of? Perhaps they were afraid of the unknown. What might happen if they went out in public? Or maybe they were afraid of strangers. Would someone recognize them? Would someone associate them with Jesus? Perhaps they were afraid of appearing ignorant. What would happen if someone questioned them? Or maybe they were afraid of plopping. Might Jesus' fate become their own? Surely they were afraid of oppressive systems, both from their own people who put Jesus on trial and from the Roman authorities who put him to death. When Jesus entered the upper room, all the doors were locked and the windows were shuttered. How did he get in? He greeted them, shalom, my peace I give to you. He showed them his wounds and breathed spiritual power into them, but one of them, Thomas, my namesake, he was missing. I wonder what it felt like to be Thomas. Had he gone out for groceries? Was he on a secret reconnaissance mission? How do you think it felt for him to walk out of a room that was stone silent in fear and walk back into a room that was blazing with the energy of a thousand suns? 
How do you think he felt when they told him about what they had seen and heard and how they had encountered the risen Christ? I don't know about you, but I would want to see and experience what they saw and experienced. I would wish that I had that. I would be jealous, perhaps even resentful, or even angry. I might also be a little bit skeptical. After all, it isn't every day that someone rises from the dead, right? If I were in Thomas's sandals, I might start spiraling with fear and self-doubt, wondering whether Jesus intentionally showed up when I wasn't there. Mm. Does he not care for me too? I think doubt isn't so much about questioning the facts as it is an expression of fear and shame. It's a longing to be included. It isn't just about seeing Jesus. It is about being seen by Jesus, to be acknowledged, to be known, to be loved. So a week passes, and get this, guess where they are? Still in the locked room. Why are they still there eight days later? This time when Jesus appears again, Thomas is there. But notice that although Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds, he doesn't need to. He has seen the Lord. He has been seen by the Lord. And all he can do is fall on his face, exclaiming, my Lord and my God. The gift of Easter is that Christ comes and comes again. Christ comes and comes again until we get it, until we come to life ourselves. Christ comes and comes again to find us wherever we are, to awaken us to his presence and to awaken us to our own belovedness in his eyes. He calls us out of our fear, whatever it is that is holding us back and keeping us from living and embracing life to its fullest. He calls us out of our fear. He raises us out of our shame, those burdens of, uh, of feeling like I'm not worthy, that I don't have anything to offer. He raises us out of our shame. His hand gently lifts our face until, uh, uh, until we look him in the eye to know that we are seen, we are loved, and we too are alive. Resurrection isn't a one-time event that we gather and blow trumpets about once a year. No offense, guys. <laughs> Resurrection is an invitation issued by God to learn that death no longer has power over us, that pain is not the end of the story, that suffering does not have the last word, that grief will not be the end of us. Resurrection is God's answer to fear. Fear changes when we learn to see through resurrection light. Through resurrection light, God says, you don't have to fear the unknown because I will help you see. Through resurrection light, God says, you don't have to fear the stranger. She is my beloved too. And if you listen carefully enough, you'll hear me in her story. Resurrection light teaches us that you don't have to be afraid of appearing ignorant. I'll meet you in your doubt and show you how suffering can be transfigured, how shame can be transformed. You don't have to be afraid of plopping. Your failure is how you learn my success. You don't have to fear oppressive systems. They don't have the last word because in resurrection, it's not just death that is overcome. It is all that brings death that is destroyed. 
in resurrection, all that shames and devalues and oppresses is exposed and emptied of its power. The cross is empty, did you notice? And so is the empty tomb. On this resurrection day, Jesus invites us out of our fear, out of our tombs, out of the locked upper room that is the church. Well, out of the locked upper room that is the church to meet him in all kinds of unexpected and surprising places. The truth of Easter is that we may learn about resurrection here, but we will only find the new life Jesus promises out there in the midst of our daily lives. When we see the overlooked, when we hear the cries of the forgotten, when we encounter the presence of God in unexpected faces and are changed, we will experience resurrection and new life too. Come back next week if you want to find out more. Let's pray. Risen Christ, Open our eyes that we may see you everywhere. Amen. If you if you would like to make an offering to support and sustain the mission of building life changing relationships through and with God. You can place your offering in the basket on the table in the back before you leave. For those of you joining us online, you can click on the giving tab and follow the links through our website. Will you stand and sing with me the closing hymn, please?
Now, 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 <laughs> I invite you to hear this blessing and to drink it into the depth of your souls because this will tell you everything you need to know about who you are, whose you are, and how to live. You are a blessed, beloved, beautiful child of God in whom Christ dwells and delights. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we all live safely and securely in a kingdom that has no end. Go in peace, pass the blessing.